Hello, Michael here from Small Robot Studio with a quick Blender tutorial for Nomad. Today we're going to be having a look at how to export your sculpts from Nomad into Blender for rendering. And hey, make sure you're subscribed with notifications on, otherwise you may be missing out on the many tutorials that we're releasing for free each week here on YouTube. So the first thing you're going to want to do is open the project menu, which is the file icon on the top left. We're going to export as a GLTF and you also want to make sure that export selection only is disabled um, because we want to export all of our separated layers if you've got more than one layer. You also want to make sure that you have export normals, export colors and export extra paint as well as layers selected. The color is going to be important because we will be rendering those in Blender. Finally you want to click the export GLTF button and select where you're going to output your file to. Once your file is exported we will jump over into Blender and import it and start rendering. Okay so now that your model is exported from Nomad what we can do here is open Blender and we're just going to start by deleting that cube and we'll import our model. So we want to go to import file import and then GLTF. Navigate to where your model is located and import it. And depending on the resolution of your model it will take some time sometimes to import. You can find out how many polys or verts your model has by right clicking in this lower bar here and clicking scene statistics. So this model has 3 million faces which is a lot um, and we're going to be going over retopologizing in a future tutorial so make sure you subscribe for that but for the moment we're just going to work with what we've got here and we're going to go ahead and get the material set up and uh, set up some lighting for it. So you can just get started and render out your work so you can have a nice look at it. So the first thing that I want to do here is I'm actually going to create what's called an empty. So I'm going to go to add empty and I'm just going to do plain axis. And this has gone into the um, first collection, the default collection. I'm just going to move it into the scene collection here just by clicking and dragging. And then what we can do is we'll just hide that momentarily and we'll select everything by clicking and dragging and then we'll unhide it and we'll control click on it there in the uh, scene collection. And because we're going to group all this together so it's easier to resize everything. So now if I just hit tab over the viewport and type in empty group we can object parent with empty groups. And then we click that and we'll hit enter. And you'll see here it's merged everything into this one object. So we can actually hide this by clicking the eye icon and we'll still be able to select it and make adjustments to it. So if you select it, you can go through to this little properties tab and we can change the scale of it. So if you click and drag on those three scale X, Y, and Z, just ch change them to five, for example, you can scale everything up, which might make it easier to deal with. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to lay out our workspace. So I'm just going to go down to the bottom right hand corner here and I'm just going to click and drag it up. So you'll see it splits that viewport. And then I'm going to do the same again in the top panel, but I'm going to move it to the left hand side. And that's because I want this side here to be my camera and this side here to be my navigation. So if you select this panel here, hit F4, what will happen is you'll be looking through the camera that you're going to render your image with. So you can click this little arrow icon here and you can go to view and you can select local camera which will just automatically select the camera and then you can lock the camera to view. So now when we move this you'll see the camera moves around. We can also go into our collection, select our camera and we can move it using the object properties. So we'll have it just straight in front of our model and then we'll just do some slight adjustments. So easiest thing to do is to just set everything to zero in its location and then hit the W key and that's going to make it so we're on the transform tool which means we can move it and we're just going to move it back like so. And then we're going to move it up a little bit and back so we can fill the screen. We'll make some further adjustments to this camera's location um, a little bit later on and we can just hide this sidebar now by going to view and deselecting sidebar. Now this bottom panel is not doing anything at the moment. We actually want this for our shader editor, which is how we're going to add materials to our object. Now materials are not just colors. They're actually what the thing is made out of. A texture could be just considered its color um, and a material is what it's made of. So for example, if it's metal, it's material is metal, but it could be black, 
so its color would be black. And currently these have all just got the default textures, each individual uh, piece of the mesh. So we've got quite a few in here. We've got the eyelashes, we've got the brows, um, we've got the cylinder, which is the hair tie by the look of it. So we can go through and we can make a changes to all these individually. We'll start with the head and we'll go to the material properties. And if you've got existing materials that come up in this drop down here, we're going to create a new one, however, and we're going to rename it to head underscore material. Now, currently we can't see any color on our mesh, so we need to assign the colors that Etika painted in when she modeled the mesh. So we're going to go through and find out what they're called. And this color is called vertex color, and we need to know the name of it to add it in correctly. So the first thing we do here is we'll go into the material editor window that we've just created. We're going to hit tab to do a search fun function and then type in vertex color and we'll get vertex color. You just hit enter and we'll run the color into the base color. Now that won't make any change to begin with because we need to tell it the vertex color node, what the vertex color is called. And if it doesn't come up here on the drop down bar for any reason, you can go to the object data properties tab with your mesh selected there. And we can go down to vertex colors and you'll see we've got one called COL and one called COL001. And we're gonna use COL. So we can just click there and select that or you could type it in. So now if we click this next button here, these are your different viewport um, shading types. So this would be wireframe and we've got our uh, smooth shading here or clay shading. And then this one here is materials and colors viewed. So we're going to go ahead and do the same thing for all of the different individual pieces. So we'll start with this here and we can go to material again, new material. We'll call this here underscore material. Now this here material, we could use the vertex color that is available, or we could just create a flat black color or whatever color you want the hair to be. So we can just select this base color input here and we can just slide that down to black. And then we go, we've got a black hair color. And because we've already created this black hair color, we could actually assign it to the eyebrows as well. So select the eyebrows and go down to the hair material and now they have the same inputs. And then if you've got eyelashes, you may want to do the same thing on those. And then that way you don't have to create the same material over and over. And the last thing we'll do is the hair tie. We'll just make this a, another new material and we'll just make this red. We can also make it shiny by adding specularity. So we can just increase the specularity here and then decrease the roughness and you'll see it becomes more shiny as you do it. So I'm going to use a roughness value of 0.2, which you can just type in, or obviously you can use the slider as well. Now, if you haven't already saved, it might be a good idea to do so. We can hit control shift S, or you can go to file and save as, and we can just call this whatever you like. I'm going to call it nomad underscore model. When you're working in CG or 3D, it's a good idea not to use special characters or spaces. So that's why I'm using an underscore there. And I've just noticed so I've missed the eye material. So we're just going to go ahead and do uh, create a new material for that very quickly, just as we had previously. And for this one, we will use the vertex color because Etika painted in some lovely green eyes for our model. And because these are eyes, we want them to be very specular. So we're going to increase the specularity and decrease the roughness. So we get some nice specular spheres there. So that is all our colors assigned. Very straightforward to do. Now we just need to set up some lights so we can render out this image. By default, you have lights already in the scene and your renderer is already set. So we just need to adjust some of these rendering settings and maybe add some different lights in to make it look a little bit nicer. So we can go to this render properties tab here and you'll see we have a render engine option. You can use Eevee, which is the real time rendering engine that Blender has, um, which is sort of works in a similar way to video game rendering does. Or you could use Cycles, which is a path tracing engine, which will give you a more realistic render result. However, you will spend more time rendering because of the calculations required to do path tracing. Now, if you have a GPU that supports cycles, you can use it to render and you'll find that your render times are decreased dramatically. So we could see preview what the render looks like by going to our camera perspective here and clicking the viewport shading option. It will take a moment and then our render will start to 
become active. If I switch about to EV, there's a simple model like this and a simple lighting setup. There may not be any reason to use cycles, but in more realistic scenes, you may wish to use cycles for the path tracing ability. To start with, we'll start with EV because I know most people's computers will be able to handle it. And we already have a light in the scene, but I really do not like it. So we're gonna delete that light and we're gonna create a new one from scratch and start a lighting setup. A common lighting setup for lighting a head model would be using a three point or two point lighting scenario. So we can go to add here and we can create a light and we're just gonna create an area light. Then using the W key, we can move that around. You can hit the E key and it'll allow you to transform the rotations and if you select one of those circles you can rotate it and you can hold down control to snap it if we hit the r key we can resize this light and we just click and drag on the circle area to make it larger in any on all axes our light is very dim at the moment so we will increase its value by going to the light properties tab and then we will increase the power by typing in something like a thousand watts and you'll see that instantly increases the value of our light there now we'll just move this using the W key, sliding it onto about a three quarter angle of our subject. We'll also move it up a little bit and then hit E. And you'll see that the rotations are not on the same axes as the object. It's because they're set to global at the moment and maybe better to set it to local. And then this way you can rotate it a little bit more intuitively. Now this is not an exact science. You can do this however you wish. Uh, this is just a very straightforward way of setting up your model though. So I'm just going to give it a slight overhead and three quarter angle. This is actually what's called a Rembrandt style lighting because we've got this slightly illuminated uh, triangle area on the opposite cheek. Now there is some global lighting enabled in the scene. So we will go to the global settings or world properties and you'll see that we have this strength value here. As we decrease that, you'll see that everything becomes darkened. I'm going to hide that sidebar with the we're going to view and sidebar again. And I'm going to turn this grid off so it's a little bit easier to see our model. So we're just going to go up to the top here at this drop down and we're going to select floor and that will turn off the grid in that viewport. So now we can see it a little bit easier here. So we're going to create another light now because you can see that we can't actually see the silhouette of our model very easy anymore. So we'll just go into our uh, our right hand viewport and go add light area light again and we're just going to rotate that and then move it behind our model using the w key and then increase the scale and we're just going to set it at an off angle paint pointing at the back left hand side it will need a high value though so we'll just increase that again to maybe a thousand and you can see that's improved the shot a lot already and now it's just a matter of deciding how much of that rim light you want. You can move it f further to the left or more to the right. So I'm just gonna have it sort of set behind there. So I'm just capturing this rim of the hair and the rim of the face. Now, if you would like to use a rim light on the other side, you could just duplicate your light and send it over there. So, so we can select our light, hit Control D and then enter without moving your mouse. Otherwise your rim light will move around all over the place and then we can select this green square, which will allow us to move the light on the Y axis. And we can just position this on the opposite side. And you can make a decision as to whether or not you want it to be exactly opposite in a similar way, or if you want a more subtle rim light on the other side. I'm gonna go for a more subtle rim light and possibly move it up so we capture a little bit of that upper silhouette as well. Now this is quite a moody little lighting setup that we have here. We can add one more light in if we wish. Now technically this is obviously no longer a three point light setup because we have three lights in the scene and you wouldn't normally use two light, two rim lights, but um, I'm just trying to cover all my bases here. The last thing we would want to do though is add in a fill light. So we can just go to add light, area light, and again, we'll just rotate this, move it into the position using the same transform tool functions that we've used previously, scale it up. And I'm gonna make this light quite large. And basically what this light is gonna do, it's gonna fill in the shadows and it's gonna fill it with a color. So we'll go to the light properties 
and we're going to increase this to it's going to be less than our key light which is the light that's giving us our primary lighting so maybe 500 to start with much less maybe 100 looks good so a common thing to do with lights is to have opposite temperatures to um, between your primary light source and your secondary light source or your fill light in this case so we can select our key light and we can change its color to a warmer color i'm going to make it fairly desaturated though basically what i'm looking for here is a sort of peachy color with very little saturation it's just going to be subtle so this is white and we're going to give it sort of 0.1 i would say saturation that works well now this light here which is our fill light we will change to be a blue hue and again this is just going to be very subtle into the blue and with that blue hue you may decide that you want slightly more val a value or power um, to your light so we'll set that to say 150 back that saturation off a little bit okay so there we go we've got a very simple lighting setup here so the last thing we want to do to finalize our shot is adjust our camera settings our camera by default is using a 50 millimeter lens i believe so if we select our camera and go to object data properties you'll see that focal length is 50 millimeters 50 millimeters is okay for new portrait photography but generally people like to use longer lenses like 70 to 100 so i'm going to use an 80 millimeter lens and you'll see that zooms the view in and the reason we're using this longer lens is that you get what's called perspective compression when you use a longer lens so it will just make it so the hair doesn't seem to be so far away from the front of the face putting it simply and then we're just going to drag our camera back and adjust it so we're filling the frame as you wish we can also add in depth of field which will add some blurriness to the areas that aren't in focus we can do this by enabling depth of field and you see everything becomes blurry that's because we haven't set the focal distance which is where we're focusing you can focus on objects by selecting this eyedropper here and then selecting an object like the object head focusing on the eyes is what you would traditionally do in portrait photography so we're going to select the eyes and then you'll see everything's back in focus what we're going to do to keep this simple is use a very unrealistic f-stop of 0.1 and you'll see that the areas to the back of the head just start to go out of focus but her eyes are still in focus and it, i would generally try and keep the majority of the face plane in focus for this sort of shot so we'll just make some adjust adjustments to get that correct value of 0.2 is giving me the face and edge of the face in focus and it's just blow, blurring the outer edge of the hair a little bit this just helps the viewer focus on the eyes um, so you don't wander too much when you look at the image for the first time though this is totally optional feel free to turn it off if you wish the last thing we need to do is set up our render resolution you can do this here uh, by default it's set to 1080p you could make it square if you wish by making the resolution on the x-axis the same as the y-axis so 1080 i'm going to keep it at 1920 though because i've already set up my shot we have a couple of little options that you could add in if you wish here under the render tab i'll go into those in a future tutorial though so we'll just check our render looks nice with our lighting which if you're happy with it you can stop the render go to the render button up the top here and click render image so once our render is finished what we can do to save it is just go to image save as and save your image out as whichever file format you would like uh, png for the best compression and quality jpeg if you're looking to save space we'll look at some of the other options in future tutorials but for now either a jpeg or a png will do now there is a lot we can do to improve this model and this render you'll notice as you zoom in that the model is rather bumpy and we can fix that with retopology and we can do quite a bit to improve the model's smoothness overall so it looks more like the cg cartoon characters that you're used to and we're going to do that in future tutorials so if you're not already subscribed make sure you are etika will be taking us through retopology in blender using this model and if you want access to this model in this scene as well as some extra lighting tips and lighting setups that will be available to patrons at the five dollar tier so thank you for watching and look forward to the next tutorial where Etika will start to take us through retopologizing the face. That's it for this tutorial. If you found it useful, make sure you leave a like so other people can find it. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe as we're bringing out CG and illustration tutorials every week, just like this one. Become a patron and access tutorial assets, bonus content, a private discord, and more by clicking the link below.